All right, look, everybody wants to know like two top things. All right, what are we doing with our hyper car? Number one. Okay. And number two, how are we buying all these crazy ass cars? And why is the chicken business so good? <laughs> we're really Stop done. Oh, uh, Mario, Mario. Taking this way too seriously. <laughs> he doesn't realize we're going to get 20 views on this. <laughs> All right, guys. Welcome back to the podcast. Tentative name. We're calling it Chicken Money. So okay. that's why I put all this nice money right here on the table so that we could show that all this money is from the chicken business. Uh, right? <laughs> this is my business partner, Edmund. Edmund Bersagian. Or you guys know him as Mondi, the reckless maniac driver on YouTube. You might not recognize him today because he got a special haircut just for this video. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. I went in I asked for a... Uh... The Top Gun look. Like, don't worry, I got you. I got you. It doesn't he look as uh, uh, I know, I know. So Top Gun on you. Like, he starts cutting my hair, and then he never faces me towards the mirror because he always knows, like, I'm like super picky. I'm like, eh, you're like, you're going too high, too high. So he has me facing away, and then he's like cutting it. He starts shaving, and then he like steps back to look at it, and he fucking starts cracking up. I'm like, oh god, this isn't good. He's like, listen, I know you asked for Top Gun, but I think I gave you '80s porn star. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever, I'll take it. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I have a date tonight. So <laughs> this is your yeah, uh, yeah. She might either not go on a date with you, or she might fall in love with you. Yeah, we'll it's like see. one of the one two of the options other. there. All right, look. Everybody wants to know like two top things. All right, what are we doing with our hypercar? Number one. Okay. And number two, how are we buying all these crazy ass cars? And why is the chicken business so good? Those are the two topics That's that I want to talk three about. Things. Well, no, it's like one, it's like two and a half things. Okay. All right. So first, let's talk about the hypercar. I already kind of touched on it, okay. and I basically let him know, like, hey, like, it's just a really bad time for us because we have been working on this hypercar project for three years now. COVID, obviously, in Italy, set us back because they completely shut down. There's a multitude of things. It was COVID. We had the wrong chassis at first. We were building it on Alfa Romeo chassis. Then we decided to I mean, build our own chassis. That was the chassis. right chassis at the time. Okay. okay? Right. I agree. So the problem is, is that once I spent all that money on that chassis, we really limited ourselves with the windshield slope. We committed to this like weird looking Alfa Romeo windshield. And then when Chrysler, whoever owns Alfa Romeo now, decided to end production of the 4C, it really eliminated the ability to get those chassis in the future. Correct. So like, that's part of the reason why we had to go to our own chassis. Why don't we just reveal image of the car? You should just put an image of the car just so we could call it out. Like, hey, we, we created this shit two years ago. No, you know? four years ago now. Well, yeah, it's like four years ago. 2018. This was our design four years ago. Yeah, the design, we'll, we'll release version one because the new design has gotten better. I mean, did you tell him why it got better? Yeah, because I stepped in. So it was all oh, Houston at yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he designed a stupid car. I was like, listen, it's not a race car enough. It's not that. So Houston has a very different taste look there's two versions of the car you have the Wyra and then you have the BC I'm not a BC guy I right? feel like you're a Koenigsegg you were like yeah a CCX guy there's a like the, the RS is a t I like the RS what right. I but I I don't really want to own the RS because I like driving the car and I like taking my wife and my kids and you've changed though so before when we first started building this car you wanted the 1600 horsepower no I still turbo. wanted to have 1600 horsepower okay. I just don't want it to look like it has 1600 horsepower Right. And I want a thousand horsepower, a driver's car. And you want it to look like it has five thousand horsepower. <laughs> you no, know, I want it to look like a Pagani. Sixteen hundred right? canards. I need sixteen hundred canards. <laughs> yeah, I want a canard on every. Si if there's, no I need this car to look like a Testarossa all over the place. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to say I, I want it to look like a uh, Pagani, but because I don't, uh, I want it to look like a Huayra R, which is like yeah. a car you guys are familiar with, right? But the car looks very, very different than any other car. Well, you know, you guys just saw the picture of it. Let us know what you think of it. We also have not agreed on the name of the car. Correct. It's currently Rain. Yeah, which is my daughter's middle name. It should have been her first name, but me and my wife fought about it a little bit. R-A-Y-N-E. I feel like it's a cool name. We're going to name the car after thunderstorms. <laughs> it's like, that's the problem. There, originally, it was called the Ragnarok. Yeah, that was the dumbest thing. <laughs> I love that name because it's like, it's Swedish. It's got like Viking to it, right? It's very powerful. They actually called the Jesco. I'm from Sweden, by the way. The Ragnarok under production before they released that. the name. They had a trademark so, on it, right? No, this cup. I bought the trademark from this guy. Well, okay. I leased the trademark. There's a tire company some weirdo dude in Tennessee. Okay. He, he has a tire called the Ragnarok. I'm like, you literally named your tire after an explosion. And he <laughs> trademarked that. Yes. Wow. So I, I paid him $5,000. You got the trademark. And he said I could use the trademark. Yeah. And then Koenigsegg 
there was like some thing with Manny Cushman. He said Ragnarok on a post. And I was like, whoa, what the F? Like, what's going on? Okay. So I called all the people that I knew. And they said that, yeah, they're, the code name for the Jesco is Ragnarok. And I said, well... Interesting. I called the guy that leased the trademark from, and I was like, yo, what the, what's going on? And he, I was in Italy. I was literally driving through, what's the mountain range from, uh, from where I went to Monaco? From uh, uh, oh my God. Uh, Emmanuel's on. house. He lives in uh, right outside uh, Mo uh, Milan and Turin. It's right in the middle. So the, the, our designer for the car. So I'm leaving his house in Italy and I get a call. Someone's saying this Manny Cushman thing. I call everybody and I'm driving through the, the I don't know. I'm just going to call him the front, the, the Italian mountains for now. But uh, I called uh, the, the trademark guy and I'm like, I gave you five grand to use it. He's like, I didn't say you could exclusively use it. I said, what the f is the point of a trademark, you idiot? He gave the trademark to them? No. Yeah, that's what he said. Wow. He said he let him use it too. And I said, you can't do that. I literally gave you $5,000, so I was the only person to use a trademark. Yeah. And I was like, do you understand the word trademark? I literally said that the definition it means I'm the only one allowed to use it. Especially everybody <laughs> in the field of automotive. And right? I told him, I said, especially what would be not my competitor, but like... The exact same kind of car, a hypercar with crazy horsepower and all this stuff. Yeah. So I like, it like ruined my, I was in Monaco, I was like gambling, I'm just spending all this money, I'm like so depressed, I'm like, oh my God, this is over. So you decided to go from a shit name to an even more shit name. Uh, thanks for calling my daughter's middle name <laughs> no, a shit no, name. No, no, listen. <laughs> That's your niece, okay? <laughs> I love you, daughter. <laughs> She's the best. That whole thing's situated, so we, we don't have a name at the moment. Like, the Rain's a cool name, but I really don't want to name it after her right now. Like, I don't. It doesn't really reflect on her personality either. Like if we named it Monroe, it'd be more fitting to be honest with you. So uh, <laughs> my other daughter is named. We named this business, the restaurant, after you. All right, it was Houston's Hot Chicken or, or now Mondays it's called Hot Chicken. Texas Hot Chicken. <laughs> yeah, well, it's HHC. Texas Hot Te Chicken. Texas or Texan? Texan. The, the thing is, so I was talking with Kirk because he's from Texas. I know, yeah. They, they he say was like, Texas. he says they, they say, say Texan. Texas. And I'm like, all right, whatever. Let's just call it Texas Hot Chicken. All right. We can just do both. All right. Just yeah. some places will have an N, some places will have an S. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. It's, I'm surprised how like how we make so much money. <laughs> Honestly, guys, like, let me let me let me enlighten you on something. Um, it's very simple in the world to make money. All you need is, is just a fantastic recipe. That's and a little bit of marketing, right? A lot of marketing, dude. Honestly, I swear. Hey guys, just wanted to give a quick shout out to our sponsor in today's video. Wooks. Wooks is an outdoor gear company that started in 1937 and is considered one of the finest wood machine companies in the world. Some of the products that they make are knives, axes, stocks, and chassis. All of their gear is made with superior craftsmanship. So the quality, it's unmatched. So here's one of their knives. Just wanted you guys to check that out. Look at the quality and the craftsmanship on there. Very like durable too. Like there ain't no shifting or anything on this knife. I would definitely recommend. Just want to try something, Mario. Let's see if you can get this. So, if you're into the outdoor life, hit the link in our bio to visit their website to learn more. So, you know what I always say do it and do it now. This is real, real talk. I am beyond impressed with the amount of people that have been coming out with these Ponzi schemes and these, like, like the Dan Lezen. Okay. Now, I don't know if you guys are familiar. This is the guy that I purchased the LFA from. So oh. I knew Dan had some shady stuff going on forever. He's this 21 year old kid, oh, that kid. with that. all these crazy hyper cars. He's a son of a Russian billionaire. Doesn't speak Russian kind of like, I don't really understand that part. I asked him one time if he spoke Russian, he's like, no. And then he has this like small house in New Jersey yeah. that was not a billionaire's house. It was like- I remember you showed me this. It was like a 4,000 square foot house. Like regular house, like $800,000. Yeah. And then all of his addresses were PO boxes. So I was like, okay, there's obviously funny business going on here, right? So. It, it's just funny because a lot of these guys are going to start coming out now with the economy going down, the recession, right? You can only keep up a scam so much, right? Just like all these crypto platforms, right? Okay. How they keep, you know, folding and folding and folding, right? Like Celsius and all these other companies have all this money, you know, layoffs and this and that. But I was thinking the other day, I was like, the car world is filled with yeah. like scumbags. And it's so easy. Guys that are over leveraged. Way over leveraged. It's so easy for guys, like Dan Lezen literally probably had like 500 cars, minimum. Okay. Not at one time, but through the years. Got it. And so, I buy this, he calls me on this LFA, and it has a, a, a flood title. He bought it back from his insurance. It got flooded in the hurricane in New York. He buys it back from his insurance. 
And the story goes is that he, he told the insurance that it was a Nuremberg car. And so he pursued them over the value for like X amount of extra money. I don't know how much they of this for like is an true. Extra 600K. No, 1.2 million extra. So they paid out 700 because on his insurance, it was stated $695,000 stated value. Okay. Right. So when you have a big expensive car, they don't give you actual cash value. They give you a set amount of money because those cars go like this. Right. right. So an F50 could be three million today and five million tomorrow. Just one goes sell at auction and it's completely worth a different value. Makes sense. So like they state the value, which was AIG. Okay. So I sent him the money for this car and I paid three hundred and sixty sixty thousand, I think. Right. I, I drove the car. I put a couple thousand miles on I it. I cleaned it up. Too. Yeah, you asshole. <laughs> um, Houston, just, uh, I, I just want to see what it sounds like. I promise I won't do anything bad. <laughs> just don't look at my Instagram. <laughs> I, I literally, Edmund has a rule never to drive any of my cars again um, because he just pushes them to the max. Like, you know, I, I've driven his cars and I've never even like in the Bentley. I took the Bentley for like two days and I like cleaned it. I like, I literally kept everything out. I didn't let my daughters wear shoes There's in the back diaper. seat. In the back seat. Clean diaper. Spare. Yeah, okay. Still spare. A diaper in the back seat. Yeah. Oh. I used it to wipe the dust off. Uh-huh. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, I buy this car for 360 and the title doesn't come. The title doesn't come. The title doesn't come. Car's here. No title. Six months go by. No title. And I'm thinking like, damn, he got me too. I knew this was going to happen. But I thought like, honestly, I thought like if I leveraged kind of like, I don't want to say my popularity, but if I leveraged my credibility in the car business, like why would he screw me over when I have such a big voice? Correct. Right. Yeah. Like I, I get when you screw someone over because they're naive or they don't look at the paperwork right or something like that. But don't screw over the person who has the biggest voice that could ruin your reputation. Right. So I call him and he's man, he's so good. Like so good. He's an artist. Do it. He is so talented. Like literally the most talented people are con artists. Yeah. So it's crazy. So he like sends me screenshots and he like edits the things and they're like portions of little text and emails from president of AIG and this person, this person. Basically what he did was, in my opinion, I don't have fact, but he basically took the full check from the insurance, okay. said he was going to give the car and not buy it back. Right. Then sold it to me. AIG's looking for the car. Okay. That's why I don't have the title, right? The bank got paid off because he had a loan on it, which right. Russian billionaire, why do you have a loan on your car? Exactly. Right? I mean, come on, man. And plus- On a, a 10-year-old car? Like, not only that, like he had a loan of like, like, like 590,000. So it's like almost like 90% loan to value, which is ridiculous, right? Yeah. Leveraging your cars is no problem. But like when you're doing it to the fullest extent, it's a little weird. Okay. So I'm thinking, okay, cool. Now AIG's calling me. Where's this car at? Where's this car? I said, it's my car, man. In your business. I said, I sent the money. No, it doesn't matter. This is my car. I'm not doing nothing to it. So I drive it, drive it, drive it. And one day I don't hear from him for like a month. And I'm like, all right, whatever. I'm just, I'm screwed. Right. I'm gonna start parting this LFA out. <laughs> I wonder how much his engine's worth, you know? And one day the just title came in the mail, literally just showed up in the mail, then, you know? And, uh, I immediately sold it. Because you made a nice profit on it. Yeah, I sold it for five twenty five. You know why you made a nice profit on it? Because of your videos. Yeah, yeah. Because the guy that bought it doesn't follow you. That's why. That's why. Uh, yeah. I thought I made a video and uh, everyone fell back in love with um, LFA. <laughs> no, that wasn't. And the then case. you got a buyer. Oh. That wasn't the case. So the point of this story, it's so easy to make money in the world because there's so many people willing to spend money. Correct. Right. So like with our chicken business or with the car business, like renting cars or with your previous businesses. I mean, let's talk about that in a second. There's so many people willing to take part in new business. Now, the two of us have no ill intentions and we, I wouldn't scam anybody if my life depended on it because it's I can't none of the, I can't remember what I had for lunch. So if I lied to you guys, I would never remember it. Okay, that's number one thing about Houston is I forget everything. Kind of my issue too. Yeah, it's actually your issue. That's why these franchisees were calling me asking about these signs <laughs> about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we changed the sign package. It looks yeah. a lot better now. But I forgot to tell everybody. I, I sent an email. I just, <laughs> I messed up because I hit reply instead of reply at all. Oops. <laughs> so yeah, the sign guy got the email, but not but the franchise. None of the, nobody but, else. Yeah. So anyway, it's, it's, uh, been, it's been resolved. So like in your first businesses, right? I know a lot of people, you actually made business vlogs, which is uh, when we first started becoming friends i was so involved i loved those videos i wanted to do them with you because it's like for the longest time nobody i mean still really nobody in the car industry that's yeah. car focused talks about their business how they made it yeah. how they made their money or how they continue to make money yep. the issue for me at the time this was like four years ago all right yeah, maybe five so actually this was now. before podcasts really right so kind of, yeah. th th this type of video was not in 
Uh, I was getting like 12,000 views. And then, uh, you know, if I did a donut somewhere in like downtown LA. 50,000, 100,000. Yeah, exactly. You know? So I was like, all right, I'll stop doing the podcast <laughs> stuff. I won't teach anybody real life skills. I'll show them how to be morons. Yeah. Yeah. The, good, good plan. The Robin. initial plan of my channel, because I would always get these DMs like, hey, what book do you recommend? Or how'd you make it? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, I would get these DMs on Instagram. So then I started thinking about it because my biggest influence is my father. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for him and all the life lessons he taught me. So I thought if I make a YouTube video where, yeah, I have like 10, 15 minutes of just like hooning around doing stupid things. But then at the end of every video, I give some business advice, sure. right? Uh, then it can really help out the, uh, the youth. So I started doing that. Like my first few videos was exactly that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I look, you know, you look at your algorithm and on YouTube. All drop off. Yeah, it's like donuts, donuts, donuts. <laughs> Start, Monty starts talking. <laughs> Stop talking. <laughs> so I was like, all right, maybe they don't want that. <laughs> so I'll stop. But yeah, so how to make a successful business? Um, we'll get to the chicken business because this is like well, a lot of people need to know this, okay. right? But like, no one understands that you're not from America, right? You can't tell from my accent. I can't tell from your accent. I can tell uh, by looking at your face. Uh, I love my face. Uh, <laughs> I was born in Tehran, Iran. Uh, my, uh, my parents are Armenian. Uh, you know, all our ancestors are Armenian, so I'm 100% Armenian. But about 400 years ago, my ancestors moved from Armenia to Iran, so I'm Persian Armenian. My dad was 24 when he had me. My mom was 20. They got married super young. They, they got married two years before that. My dad uh, was a super hard worker. So my uh, business... Uh, Etiquette? Ethics. Uh, etiquette. Ethics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mess up my words sometimes. Uh, now you can tell I'm a foreigner. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I learned it all from him. So he, when he was 14, he dropped out of school. He started working at a mechanic shop. And uh, when he was 16, he, he worked like crazy long hours. So in Iran, you know, there's a lot of farmers. It was, it was a mechanic shop, like a uh, machine shop. Yeah, machine fix, shop. Yeah, fix uh, broken engines, like essentially. Generators, engines, things to help you. Correct. Like tools. Yes. So uh, farmers in Iran, you know, this is like back in the 80s, uh, early 80s or late 70s, one of those. Their water pumps, if they broke down, their crop would die, right? That was it. So they would lose like tons of money. So they would drop off their water pumps whenever it broke. You know, sometimes they would drop them off at like 5 p.m. but the store closes at 5 p.m. So my dad would stay overnight. He would fix them, give, the, give it to the farmer in the morning so he could go, you know, mm -hmm. irrigate his farm. And uh, the farmers would always like tip him extra money for that, you know, like, thanks for helping us out. So that's what my dad started doing from 14 to 16. At 16, he became like the manager, he essentially had the keys to the place. Uh, he made a, a lot of money, saved up all that money. When he was 18, he opened up his own and uh, he got married at 22. So he built, you know, this is like Iran back in the days. He had a brand new BMW. So wow. I guess that's where I got my car thanks for. Hell yeah. Right? Like, uh people over there have paycons like you haven't even heard of a paycon but no. that's like imagine it's like, like a, a plastic bucket a hyundai or a kia but with a uh, propane powered engine <laughs> okay <laughs> like 50 horsepower like a go-kart engine it's that's a go-kart engine in a honda yeah so yeah that and he had a Datsun pickup brand new as well he built a house he built a three-story house from the ground up so he was doing really well and he was a foreigner too right so i mean there is like some racism sure. over there right uh because we're christian and uh iran is a muslim country so there's some tension there. And then he had me, I was like six months old. And then one day he's at work, this military van just pulls up, grabs him, tosses him in, you gotta go to war. It's the Iran-Iraq war. So my dad's like, oh, I just had a baby. Christians generally back in those days- Were front lines. Front line, yeah. right, dispensable. Mm -hmm. So my dad bribed uh, the general. He gave him a 50,000 tumon, which is Persian money. I don't know how much that is. Maybe that's like $5,000 back then or $10,000. I have no idea. Gives that to him. He says $31. <laughs> yeah. Now today. Yeah. Now it's literally like $3. <laughs> but back then, you know, it, it was worth some money. So uh, he g gives it to the general. He says, hey, give me a week off. Let me go say bye to my wife, my kid. All right. I just had this newborn. And then uh, I'll come back to the army. I was like, okay. So within that week, Gives his business, his house, his cars, everything to his brother, his younger brother, who's my uncle. And uh, we fled to Turkey on donkeys, not even horseback. Okay, through the mountains. It's like the slowest animal ever. Yeah, ever. but if we got caught, we would have been executed. Sure. And my dad had le no jewelry, nothing. Less than $300 because if he went there with money, so if he sold his business, took money to, you know, this new life, the smugglers would have killed us off and robbed us, mm -hmm. right? So that was the thing. So go, we went to Turkey with like no money. 
And then uh, we had an aunt, my dad's aunt, mom's sister, lived in Sweden. It was like the only family we knew that was like outside uh, of Iran and Armenia. So we decided, let's go to Sweden. Went to Norway, actually, as refugees. And then uh, the aunt's husband drove from Sweden to Norway to a neighboring, uh, they sh share the same border. Picked us up, took us to Sweden. My dad started working for him as, uh, like a, as a chef. He owned a pizzeria. Okay. So my dad got involved in, uh, in that business. So I went from mechanic to now being a chef, Italian chef. It was a Italian pizzeria. Six months later, he saved up money. He opened up a uh, cafe shop called Sorrento. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he had his thing for Italian names. Okay. I don't Italians know why. Italians are the greatest yeah. race of men. The first restaurant was Palermo. Oh, nice. The second one, <laughs> nice. the cafe shop was uh, Sorrento. So. Mm uh i have one like f memory from sorrento where it got robbed one day it, like stole everything in sweden in sweden yeah it's so weird right it was like in downtown Uppsala as well but like sweden you you think it's like the f like one of the safest places in the world and the one thing i remember from that is the robber's footprints on the door so it was a door and then on top of the door it was glass so he busted through the glass but anyway he climbed, he climbed up. up that's that's like my very early memory from like when i was like three years old that's funny and then he opened up a uh, another restaurant called palm springs very nice <laughs> there's a trend here <laughs> it's not the funny thing about the trend this. here did your dad look at a map and maybe just name this... all the restaurants up to popular <laughs> cities or like what? Cool places, right? <laughs> i'm actually gonna post a picture okay i'll, I'll upload a picture right now mario i know this, this is from like so the funny. early 90s okay so there's you know palm springs he's thought of like palm trees so he had this like painting of like Hawaii, like <laughs> coconut trees, not knowing Palm Springs in California is a, a desert. desert. Yeah, oh. no ocean, nothing. <laughs> so that was, a, that was always a funny joke whenever uh, my dad and I came to uh, the U.S. for the first time to visit in like 94, went to Palm, Springs, to Palm Springs, went to Palm Springs, and my dad was like, oh, fuck. Oh, shit. <laughs> what is this? I think of us. <laughs> that restaurant, Palm Springs, that's when I have some of the best memories of my life. That was, uh, it was on a, far, like, it was on a highway right next to a farm. So I grew up on a farm in Sweden. And then we decided to move here to the US. It was too cold in Sweden. Like it snows like six, seven months out of the year. It's depressing. During, during winter time, the coolest thing about Sweden. Is during winter it's warm? No. Uh, any like Nordic country, yeah. you know, you have the Nordic lights. Uh, during summertime, the sun never sets. Okay? It's just, it's like dusk. All day. No, not all day. From like, uh, the sun's literally out until midnight and then from like two to four a.m it's dusk but it doesn't get dark right you can still see and then the sun comes out up at four o'clock in the morning and uh it's the exact opposite in the winter so, so during winter hours of sunlight yeah literally like three four or five hours of sunlight that's why sweden has uh some of the highest uh suicide huh? suicide yeah there's a lot of alcoholics there because of depression that's why they, uh, we have great musicians because all we do is uh, like all they do not we but uh, all they do is like stay inside and DJ all day. That's all they can do. They can't go out and play sports during winter time. That's crazy. Yeah. We take it for granted in America how easy everything is here. We have a lot of problems. Yeah. But our problems are 99% based on the media, right? We don't have like like essentially weather issues, you know, where it's like some dramatic thing. We have most places that four seasons, you know, you get some diversity. All the roads are pretty nice. You know, a lot of the problems that we have all around the world we don't have here you know what the biggest thing was for me when i moved from sweden to the u.s it's in the u.s sex is like shunned upon okay so for if you're watching a movie right, and there's like sex scenes in it it's rated ma but if there's like gun violence it's, it's pg-13 it's, right it's no big deal crazy right? maybe even pg right? <laughs> in sweden it's the exact opposite in europe it's the exact opposite sex no problem Rated G. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> go, go. But like Everybody anytime sucks. there's a gun involved, no, it's like rated R. That's crazy. Yeah, it's the exact opposite over it, here. Look, you're, I mean, you won't have to get on this topic, but you know, you're giving kids like the notion of all the gun stuff early on, right? In the yeah. video games. I mean, it's just, we're, we're, we're doing it the wrong way. You know, we're, guns are a cultural thing in America, right? right. Most cultural issues, yeah. right, are caused by the media because they exploit them. I'm super pro gun, right? Oh, yeah, you are. But I'm really pro education, right? So, like, my view <laughs> is that you educate. Don't ever <laughs> for shooting this 
fucking morons. Okay. Oh man. Period. Yeah. All right. I've never been around anybody who's fired an AK in the air like this. Oh my god. That's I literally so... flew under my Hummer. I was like, where do you think those bullets go, Edmund? They come back down. I was like, oh, I have to go to space. <laughs> oh my god. But my kids know how to use them. Not like they, we don't go shooting, right? They're a little too young for shooting. Is a little bit. They don't have the, the strength, yeah. but like they know where to put them, not to touch them, all that stuff. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm just really pro education on that stuff. And I think that, too. but yeah, no, it's, it's crazy how culturally we're different from all over the world. Right. Yeah. And so my point is you grow up in Sweden, you learn all these new things. You come over here. Um, oh, this was a it, whole new life for me coming it, here. A whole new life. It and crazy. You, it actually happened to your dad the same. So go back to that story. When your dad came over to America, all right, the yes. same exact thing happened. He sold all his businesses to ah, his brother. Okay. So my dad had been talking about moving to America for, you know, a couple of years. So my mom, my sister and myself, we moved here first to do the paperwork, you know, uh, hire a lawyer, you know, do the immigration work and all that stuff. And then once we got approved, my dad was going to move over. So that took some time so the aunt's husband the same guy that like took us in was having an affair with a norwegian girl jesus had a baby with this norwegian girl no one knew about it my dad's cousin over here my dad's in the process of selling the business and then my dad's cousin younger cousin over here passes away from cancer uh no one knew about it the family just kept it to themselves uh she's a young girl she was a 21 year old girl uh my dad was very close to her in Iran. Mm -hmm. They were like, she was like, you know, she was very small. She was like, I don't know, maybe like 10 years old. He raised her essentially. Okay. So they were very close. And then uh, when that happened, my dad had, uh, he had like a stroke. He like, my mom told him over the phone, he like collapsed. He had this like thyroid issue after that. He like lost all his weight. He became like a hundred pounds. It was crazy. But anyway, so my dad had to come to the US, right? He couldn't wait over there to sell the business. So this guy, the aunt's husband said, you go, I'll sell the business, I'll send you the money. Cool. He was like right in the middle of selling the business too. He already had a buyer, but it, he didn't want to wait like an extra two, three, four weeks, whatever it was going to be. So uh, he moves here to the US. Uh, we didn't have much. We lived in an apartment. My mom had like a 1991 uh, Corolla. Sick. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, it had a it had cruise control on my car. <laughs> that was like an option. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, it was like a big deal. <laughs> so uh, then uh, this guy takes the money and flees. <laughs> no one hears from this guy. Yeah, M.I.A. Heard, you told me that you actually saw him like 20 years later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, we can get to that. Uh, the guy takes my dad's money, takes all the money, leaves. And my dad, like, you know, we were like really well off in Sweden. We were like upper middle class, right? And then over here, he starts working for four bucks an hour as a pizza delivery guy. Right? So just imagine that lifestyle, right? So doing really well in Iran, starting at zero in Sweden, and then moving here and having to start from zero again. Well, doing really well in Sweden. Doing, doing really well in Sweden, moving here. And then here. moving here. Yeah. It's like, it's crazy. So, and America is the worst place to start fresh. You well, know, it, because if you don't speak the language, it, that's what I'm saying. Right. It's, it's very difficult because we're essentially very picky with people that are foreigners. Oh, you know, absolutely. It, I mean, most countries are right. And then uh, one day some guy just offered him a, a position as a tow truck driver. Uh, he's like, can you drive trucks? My dad's like, yeah, I can drive trucks. I can do this. He's like, OK, cool. So it's a triple A company. It's oh, funny. Stuff. Nice. Yeah. So. The guy, the owner of the business was Persian. So that's, you know, they had some connection sure. that way. Uh, the guy hires my dad, gives him a call, you know, says, go to this address. <laughs> my dad has no idea, <laughs> any, like any direction, sense of direction in L.A. Because, he you know, hasn't been here. So he like opens up the Thomas Guide and like, you know, starts looking like, where the f am I supposed to go? But anyway, <laughs> he's like 30 minutes late to the call trying to find this place. But he does that for like six, seven months. And then uh, when we moved here to the U.S., Every army, I don't know why, there were like a thousand families. There's probably only like 50 armies left in Sweden now. 50. All of us decided to move to the U.S. at the same time. And between uh, 95 and 97, like we all migrated here. That's cool. Yeah. So we're like, we're still very close to Swedish Armenians. Uh, so one of my father's employees, her name's Remik, uh, Armenian lady, divorced, two daughters. Uh, she gave my dad a $20,000 loan. At the time, my you know dad had no money. gave She gave him a twenty 
thousand dollar loan at twenty percent interest, pretty high interest. Very nice, <laughs> right? Back then, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, uh, gave my dad a loan to, so my dad could go buy a tow truck. He bought a used nineteen ninety one Isuzu NRR. Nice. It's the same one we have. Yeah, so yeah I was gonna say the yeah, same yeah, one we, we bought. We have like chicken. a newer one. We have a newer one, but he bought the older one. Anyway, bought that. He started towing cars. Went to all the junkyards. Uh, again, Armenian community. So he went to all the Armenian junkyard owners and said, "Hey, I've got this truck. You know, can I tow your cars?" And he started towing cars for twenty-five bucks, That's like each one. And then, uh, you know, the good tows were like fifty bucks. All right, if you double up, it's like eighty. So every Saturday, ten, like my dad, my dad would pick me up when I was eleven years old, and he'd take me to work with him. And uh, you know, I would help him out. It's like my bonding time with my father. And he started talking about, you know, so I've told. X amount of cars, you know, this is how much we made today. How many more cars do we need to tell? Like, what distance do we need to tell? You know, because we charge by the mile or mm -hmm. hour, whatever it is, uh, to make our nuts for the day. So he gave me a lot of business lessons early on. So I like, as an 11 year old kid, I would, you know, do the math, you know, if we get a tow to Fontana, we do this and then pick up from there, we go to like Gardena and this and that, you know, we'll make the 300 bucks for the day. Business started doing well. My dad, my dad's like a real, he was a really hard worker. And then uh, within a year, he paid off the loan. And uh, he bought his second truck, right? At the time, everyone else, it was like a bunch of like in this area, there's a bunch of mom and pop tow truck operators, you know, it's Armenian men that had one truck and all the trucks were named after themselves. Like, my dad was like Savo Tone, there's like Rosmic Tone, there's like <laughs> Noel Tone, and Henry Tone, you know? <laughs> Sarkis, and all those. Anyway, so my dad was like, I'm gonna buy a second truck. And then everyone was like, you're crazy. Like, you're going to like bankrupt yourself because he's going to go buy a brand new truck, have a big payment, right? They're like, you can't survive, right? How, you don't, how are you going to get the business? My dad's like, if I get a second truck, I'll get the business. The business will come. So he bought the second truck and he started walking around to all the other junkyards and, hey, I have a second truck now. You know, whenever you call, I'll have a truck available so you don't have to wait a day, two or mm -hmm. three, you know, for someone to go pick up your car. So he started getting more calls. Second truck was busy, bought a third, and bought a fourth, bought a fifth. So I learned from my dad, you know, take risks, right? 100%. Uh, you'll do well. Uh, business always rewards the bold. Yeah, 100%. Then uh, at this point, I'm 22 years old. I'm going to college, UC Irvine. Fights for pharmacy school. I was getting into pharmacy school. It got accepted. And then the 08 recession hit. Dad's business took a crap. Okay. Did it really? Um, dude. So gas prices in 08. That's true. They were went like from two dollars a gallon to like four or five, right? Five. Yeah. It was like five fifty in California. And then uh, people lost their jobs. So if someone needed a tow, they would literally call their friend that had a pickup truck and they would tie a rope from one car to the other and like they would tow themselves, right? So dad's business was doing terrible. Uh, we had a line of credit. We were like maxed out on line of credit. So I said, I'll take a year off. I'll help my dad out. Because uh, again, my dad had a like a language barrier. Did right? you do repos or no? At the time, no. No. But did you get into that? Yeah. yeah. So that helped. I mean, obviously, right? Yeah. There's a lot of business there, isn't it? I got a gun pulled on me a few times. Oh, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I started working for him. I got a say, CHP contract, Metro Free with Service Patrol, uh, AAA. And the first year we went from like struggling five to thriving 12 trucks. I was like, I see potential here. This could be a good business. I want to be a pharmacist to open up a chain of pharmacies, but you know, I, I never saw myself in a white coat, right? That's what was I mean. I it's went very to fashion boring. school to manufacture denim. Is, I mean, is that what well, you, you know, up on that fashion? I got this fashion right here. <laughs> I'm gonna backtrack a bit. My first job was 16. I was 16. I worked at McDonald's, worked the drive-thru line. I wanted a car. My dad wouldn't buy me a car. I said, dad, if I get a job, he said, you're not responsible. I said, if I, if I get a job, am I responsible? He's like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go down the street to McDonald's, first place I applied, get the, get the job. Like five bucks an hour, minimum wage. Got a car next yeah. day. I started working Friday, Monday I had a brand new car. <laughs> <laughs> so then I was like, okay, I quit. <laughs> I got I the quit. Car. I got this job. Yeah. I, I worked at McDonald's for two weeks and then I got a job at Best Buy and uh, my paychecks at Best Buy were like trash. I was like making like 200 50 bucks. It's so funny. I worked at Best Buy too. That was my first job. Yeah, we were very similar, you yeah. and I. My, my first job was Best Buy. That's how I started my little business, Mountain TVs. Because I would sell them a TV. Yeah. And then Best Buy charged like 1200 bucks to yeah. mount it. And I was like, Geek I'll do it for 500 Yeah. <laughs> One week, I worked, I worked a lot. I got a $300 paycheck. And then uh, I took that paycheck. And uh, I bought three Gucci bags. They were 99 bucks each from China. 
I bought three of them, flipped them on eBay for uh, like, it was like 250 each. Okay. So I turned 300 to 750. This is nice. I'm smart. Yeah. And then I bought seven. <laughs> and I flipped uh, 21. Right? Yeah. And then just flip, flip, flip. Eventually, at the very last stage, I would buy containers from China. And then Gucci, actually, those bastards, <laughs> uh, they contacted eBay that I was selling, you know, replicas and they shut down my eBay account. I had a bunch of money in PayPal. It took That's it? how I get paid. They froze my PayPal account and then, like all the money went to Gucci. Anyway, so Damn, yeah, that, that sucked. That was terrible. But anyway, I went to school after that, started to go to school. And then, uh, you know, I helped my dad out up to 12 trucks. And then from there, you know, I saw potential. So I, I decided I'll just, I'm not going to pharmacy school. I'll help my dad out. And uh, three years after that, we were up to like 25 trucks. And then I decided to branch off on my own. Start Edmund Stone. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to pick my name. <laughs> so creative. Yeah. By the way, when I worked at my dad's place, I worked seven days straight. The only time I would take off was Saturday nights. So we had this like really cool warehouse, 10,000 square foot warehouse. Upstairs, I built a bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, shower. So I lived at work. Uh, downstairs where the office is. Uh, the only time I would take off was Saturday night. So Saturday night, I'd go out, hang out with my friends. I never really enjoyed my 20s. Right? I was always working, never that partying. I never had the, the party scene. Yeah. That's why you're 35 years old partying every night. Yeah, I don't know, whatever. It was an excess <laughs> of four o'clock in the morning last night. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Sunday morning, I'd get back to work, work all the way until Saturday afternoon, and then, you know, I'd take off. But I did that for seven years. So then uh, I took off. When I was like 26 years old, I decided to do my own. Started Edmonds Towing, and then uh, just started popping up all these new locations, like all over the place. I had one in Santa Clarita, one in Sun Valley, two in Lebec, uh, one in La Puente. And then that's when the business really took off. We went from uh, like 20-ish trucks to five locations, 52 trucks. And I stick, stuck in the automotive industry. I had uh, two NAP Auto Care Centers, repair shops. I had a uh, Hearst rent a car. I had a uh, tire shop. So it was all in the automotive, doing really well. And then my father passed away. Uh, he had a heart attack. That was a big shift in my life. The day it happened, I think I've told you the story. I got LASIK. So we had, a, we had a huge party at my house and LASIK eye surgery, uh, party at my parents' house, LASIK eye surgery. Uh, I couldn't see anything. And then my dad never drank. But when we had friends and family over, you know, we'd make a toast, right? And so this night, he like made two toasts, shots, that's it barbecuing outside and then uh my dad goes upstairs he's like um <clears throat> i don't feel well like my shoulder is getting numb can you rub me i have my like sunglasses on i can't see anything it's like pitch dark so i started rubbing him and i'm like teasing my dad i'm like that come on like get your shit together you know i had two shots and you're already junky lightweight you know you amateur uh and then uh i go back to my room blah 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 relatives leave i fall asleep and then um, my dad starts complaining to my mom, like, you know, I, don't, I really don't feel well. Let's, uh, let's go to the hospital. So my mom says, okay, let me drive you. Um, they walk downstairs and my dad collapses. And uh, like, I'll, I'll never forget um, the like terror in my mom's voice when she was like shouting my name. Um, so I, I, I wake up, right? I rush down and then super blurry vision uh if anyone's had lasik you know exactly what it's like like six hours after surgery you could like see but not really uh i see my dad i start giving him a cpr his like tongue's down his throat i pull his tongue out he comes back to life for like a second and then um when he fell he hit the alarm and pulled the alarm down like there's like sirens is blaring in the house mom's on the phone with 911. i'm trying to like talk to them and like oh um uh, Ambulance come like three minutes, four minutes later, um, giving them CP, um, whatever the hell it's called, mm -hmm. they put the thing on them, shock them back to life. And like his pulse would come and leave, but I, my dad, my superhero, right? Yeah. It's like, it's my Superman. Uh, it's just a fucking heart attack. Go to the hospital. Um, uh, everything's going to be fine. So we're in the waiting room and then, uh, so the nurse comes and asks my mom, like, what was his, uh, where was his date of birth? Uh, sorry, uh, where was he born? Place of birth. 
And then, like, it hits my mom. My mom was like, why are you asking that? I was like, mom, I just, just want to know. So, um, doctor comes in a few minutes later, and he's like, uh, sorry to say he didn't make it. And I'm still in shock. It doesn't register. Right. Right. Your dad does not pass away when you're, like, 27 years old. I'm like, doctor, what's it mean? Like, he didn't make it. Right. Like, didn't make it like tonight like you have to sh change shifts like you know like I, my mind's all over the fucking place uh he, he passed away and then uh yeah that's when my life like really changed um i remember i just like took my mom and my sister in and i uh, you know told them everything's gonna be okay and then uh i stepped into like the father role and yeah, my sister was young my sister was like 24 years old the just just about to start law school. You know, my mom was young too. My mom's 47. Anyway, so my dad and I worked hand in hand at the towing business. Like every Christmas we worked together. Every New Year's we worked together. You know, we'd give our employees time off. And like some of the employees that were like single and want to work, they would work. The ones that had families want to take off, they would go. And like we would, uh, we would run, you know, the night shift because our business was uh, 365, 24-7. Okay. So then... He passed away in October, October 12th. Uh, that New Year's, I was working, towing, and then um, I towed this guy's car. And then uh, my dad had towed him. My, my dad was like this greater than life. Like this, everyone loved my father. At his funeral, there were like 5,000 people. It was insane. Like all of Forest Lawn was like shut down. My dad helped so many people. Like, I'll tell a story um, later, I'm like just like his generosity. So like, I'll get to it now, I guess. Um, my mom's cousin, her husband passed away from cancer. And then, um, you know, they were struggling. He had a really cool car, Integra. Oh, nice. Yellow, completely riced out. Okay, <laughs> like super riced out. But like, that was like his, his like passion, right? He worked on the car, it was like yellow interior and all that, loudest exhaust, blah, blah, blah. Rims dropped, like Fast and the Furious car. Uh, he was supposed to pass that car down to his uh, younger son, who's my cousin. And then uh, the mom had to sell that car to, uh, you know, pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, when my dad found out, he went to the dealership, bought her a car, put it on the tow truck, took it to her house, called her out, said, hey, um, got your car. You know, you know, you could go to work now, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I didn't know about this. No one knew about this. My dad wouldn't tell anyone. I found out about this from my cousin. And my, I guess my dad had told him, like, don't tell anyone. I found out about this through my cousin after my father passed away, you know, and, you know, the week of everyone's at your house. Telling and stories. Everyone's telling and stories. A bunch of different stories like this. Um, but anyway, so pe people love my dad. So basically you had full responsibility oh yeah the so company. it's new year's i'm towing this guy's car for AAA in sun valley and then uh you know we started talking and then you know what are you doing for christmas blah 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 you know i mean for new year's you know um the guy just got in an accident and then uh i told him and then you know my father has just recently passed away like you know i recognize this name of sebo towing that's i was working for that company that day like you know sebo had told my car like Ten years ago, like he's like, but he uh, remember my father from like back in the day. Like he was a very funny guy. Blah blah. Anyway, so at that point, I decided I need to sell everything I do in this business. It just reminds me of my father. Sure. I was, dude, I was like, I was like, I had to put on a f like a strong suit. So my mom it was the dumbest thing I ever did. I thought if I pretend like I'm like an iron wall, no emotions, don't grieve, that my mo mom and my sister will, you know feel like there's a man in the house, right? But because of that, I never grieved, and I, but I left my mom and my sister grieve. Till this day, I still struggle with, like it's, it's been like eight years, but I, I still struggle uh, with it. I'm not, I haven't accepted it. Maybe you should go to therapy. I should, yeah, I've been, been it doesn't, doesn't help. It's a little <laughs> too late. If anyone, this is my advice, if anyone has like a family member that passes away, take the time off from work, um, deal with it, uh, grieve, soak it in, you know, learn to accept it and then, you know, anyway, so I decided to sell the business. I said, I'm going to sell four. I'm going to keep my latest one, which is in La Puente. And then one day I'm reading the newspaper. This is uh, in, uh, oh man, uh, 2015, 16, no, 2015. 
uh, just turned 2015. Uh, the oil market had crashed. The barrel was like 32 bucks a barrel. Banks weren't giving out any loans for guys that want to buy oil fills. So it was like all cash transactions and they were, they were, oil fills were trading for super cheap because the price of a barrel was so low. So I was like, maybe I'll get in the oil business. Just buy one. Who cares? Why not, right? <laughs> so let me sell four. I'll keep one. I'll try this oil thing out. Because remember, at this point, I'd been working every day. Forever. Forever. Right? Yeah. My entire 20s, I'd been working. At Edmonds Tongue, I had a mobile home in the back that I would let you sell. I went there. Yeah, oh I had two, uh, three bedroom mobile home, <laughs> double stacked. The best mobile home possible. Uh, freaking trailer park, <laughs> trash. Versace mobile home. <laughs> but Lamborghini Murcielago. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Didn't make any sense. <laughs> you guys so. ever seen those pictures of the Bugatti parked at the uh, mobile home? That was when I visited Edmonds. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> that, that was my life, right? I had the mobile home inside the tow yard. So I was like, listen, I, I need to enjoy my life a bit. I need to take some time off. It reminds me too much of my father. Uh, I need to go and like enjoy life. So the, the thought of getting mailbox checks, oil filled in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. I get checks. I don't have to work. It was like the greatest thing in the world for me. So did that, it took off, did a few flips on them. And then I sold the other tone company. And uh, that's, I uh, started going to like Europe like the first time taking quarter million dollar vacations yeah those are fun uh i, I went backpacking it was the funniest thing i went backpacking uh, when i right like when i sold the business so i called my friend rob my best friend you know i'm used to working like waking up at five o'clock in the morning but like now i slept in it's like two o'clock <laughs> i wake up uh, call rob i'm like hey rob want to go have lunch you're 33 I, years I, old like free time no i was like i was 28 uh he's like I'm, right, I'm at, he's like i'm at work <laughs> i'm like <laughs> Oh. Uh, <laughs> I forgot. That's how it worked. Uh, Call my cousin Narv. I'm like, Narv, want to go to lunch? He's like, uh, I'm at work. I was like, you know what? Fuck this. <laughs> going to lunch for myself. Yeah. I took the next <laughs> flight out, like literally next day. Uh, went backpacking in Europe. I thought, you know, I'll go find myself. Super like cheap, no five star, nothing. I'll stay at hostels. I'll like find chickens. I'll pluck them. I'll kill them. <laughs> I'll start a fire. I'm thinking Europe, you know, <laughs> like in the forest somewhere. So that lasted like two days. That lasted okay? about two minutes. Yeah, no, two days. So <laughs> I never found the chicken. <laughs> but uh, I never so found the chicken. I'm in a hostel. It's like. 10 rooms sharing one bathroom. And then this like Indian guy, curry explosion in the bathroom. Oh. I was like, fuck this, I can't do this. So, the Where's the Ritz Carlton? Yeah, yeah, the rest <laughs> of the, the of my trip was all five star hotels. That's called backpacking, right? Yeah. That's what you called it? Backpacking through the Ritz Carlton? Glamour packing. <laughs> Glamour packing. Yeah. So uh, that's, uh, that's that. And then uh, I started building real estate in Southwest Florida with uh, my business partner, Michael. So I went through this, transition stage in life where I no longer want to be the worker. I want to be the investor. Okay. I have, I'm like rich with cash at this point. Cause I sold all my businesses. I wanted to invest in other people. You do all the hard work. We'll do 50, 50. Michael's the greatest business partner I had next to you. Uh, you guys are like both there. Michael never cheated me out of a cent, nothing. So he would build in Florida. I would send the money. He would build, uh, that business took off. It was really well. I was building low income housing, um, like section eight houses. I we could have built mansions, which would have been nice and glamorous, but I decided to help out the poor, um, build section eight houses. So, so kids that like grew up in like Rico, mobile right? homes. Yeah. Or like, you know, the people that were displaced because of hurricane Irma yeah, yeah. and all of those, they could have a good house, a good chance at making it in this country, just like myself, right? It's a whole immigrant story. It resonates with me. So I decided to build those. So I would build like 40 to 60 houses at a time. Uh, that did well. And then uh, I did solar systems. That business was a flop uh, because I was an investor. I gave the money to someone else. He was going to run the business, right? That failed. I got into marijuana. That failed. I don't smoke weed. I don't know any, like, hey, we got the craziest strain. Come check yeah. this out. I'd go, like, smoke. Like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> it's great yeah. weed. It's like, yeah, next week, yeah, I got a better strain. Come smoke this. I'm like, it's the same. <laughs> it feels the same. It's, it's making me very stupid. Exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, got into that. I had a few businesses like that. AGX. AGX, yeah. So AGX, I mean, I was spending, like, so much money over there modifying my cars. And then... Uh, Mitch needed to switch from Famous Auto Works to AGX. I was like, okay, I'll be the investor. All right. 
free labor. Yeah, you know, right. Fix up my like supercars for free. Uh, cool. Yeah. I'm good with you it. You just buy the shop and the equipment, the tools, uh, float yeah. the payroll for a couple months, and then you just get your car worked on forever. Exactly. All right. It was the greatest thing. So I had a few businesses that failed that never made me money. And, and then I wrote, that was my, I guess, another lesson to me is no one has my work ethic. Yeah. Right. You, I thought it was so easy because like my entire town when like I was doing the towing thing and all I kept thinking was, man, if I had more money, I could buy more trucks. I could expand into areas. I can do this. I could get these clients. It was always the money that held me back. It's, uh, it's not my work thing ethic. with royalty. Yes. When I was with royalty, I said, you know, I was so conservative in the beginning. I just wanted to pay cash for everything. Yeah. You know, like I went through the same 07 thing that you did, right? Where my parents, they lost all their money. Yeah. You know, my mom had tons of houses. My dad had, he'd kind of already been retired at that point, but like he had no investments that were, were lasting. So when I graduated in 07, I was like so conservative. I was so scared. I never partied. I never drank. I just worked 24 seven because like I didn't want to be homeless, you know? And I felt like, you know, where I had came from, like I was in the school of all these super rich people. Right. Yeah. And I'm like always the brokest one there, you know, but like I had more work ethic and more intelligence than every one of them combined. Right. And I knew that today it's proof that, they're all in a certain position and I'm in a different position, right? Um, and it's like, when I was doing royalty, I was always so conservative and I never wanted, I just needed more money and I could make more money, right? I got more cars, I'd rent more cars. Got more cars, rent more cars. And that's why we get along so well because we had the same life. Correct. We literally did the exact same thing. And uh, it's, it's really crazy because I invested in not really that many other things that I wasn't in control of, but I did do two, you know, and it, it didn't go anywhere, you know? You're just chasing your money and losing it for no reason. Correct. Because the other people involved, they, they're just, they're not the same. Not as, not as smart as you, not as bright as you. Well, they also rely on you to do most of the work, right? And, and they and also it, think, fuck this rich guy. He's exactly. got all the money. That's right? the number I'm one I'm the one thing. doing all the work, right? So. I hate being called a rich guy. It drives me nuts. Because I don't, I'm not, rich people would be like, if I gave all of my money to someone else that didn't earn it, yeah. that would be a rich guy. I'm the same guy I was 15 years ago before I had all this money. I got all the money because I worked for it, yeah. right? If you go and choose to do a job, like you choose to work at McDonald's, right? You're gonna get the money you deserve for the work you put in. Correct. We got the money we deserve for the amount of work we put in, right? Like yeah. I just told a story earlier today, I sold my house from my wife I that I had just married to buy a Lamborghini. Oh, oh, you're talking about that one, not selling the house the second time. Oh no, the second time that was way worse. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but like the first time I sold my house, like I risked 120% of what I had. Yeah. I took out debt at 20% interest from all of my family. Yeah. I, everybody that wanted to loan me 10,000 or 20,000, anybody who had anything, right? I would give them 20% interest, right? I got credit cards just to max them out, right? I took all the risk. Yeah. And when you take the risk, what do you deserve? The same paycheck I give to the guy at the front that, that works for me? Of course not. Of course not. I yeah. mean, do it vice versa, yeah. right? Like, it, it bothers me so much when someone, like on the YouTube comments, you know, and I'm sure because I say it, I bring it up. I'm the, the, the number one comment is going to be a rich asshole. My, <laughs> my biggest thing is that because some one stupid YouTuber once said that uh, I'm a trust fund baby. <laughs> Everyone on my Instagram, like trust oh, fund, trust fund, trust yeah. fund, trust fund, rich asshole, blah, blah, blah. Not, not knowing yeah. that the struggle, not knowing I changed tires on the side of the freeway with like cars. Like one time I got hit, this, um, mirror hit me on my shoulder. Shit. My shoulder was like bruised up, terrible. Imagine a car sideswiping you like, like 65 60 miles, miles an hour. hour. I so. mean, you were there like when we first met, I think even that weekend, I literally went out in my own tow truck to go right. change a tire on the side of a road for a Lamborghini for a customer. Yeah, like yeah. when I didn't, when I first started this business, I didn't have a car washer. I would answer the phone. I would rent the car. I would go get the car. I would wash the car myself. Then I would deliver the car. Like it was just me, yeah. you know, my wife was here too, to help me. But like people think that because like, you have all this stuff now that you're not the same person. And they see the present. They never see. They never you, see you know, the past. The they never chapters. see how you work yeah, there. You see the, the book cover. It, I wish that someone could see me now, like how unhealthy I am and how much I've sacrificed to get to this point, right? To have opportunity for everybody else. I mean, just like five out of like the nine employees that I have at Royalty make six figures. Yeah. I, I mean, that's why they stick around with you for so long. My, my theory in life is that 
everybody says money doesn't buy happiness, right? And I think that's the opposite. I think it does buy happiness. I think freedom, freedom is happiness. No, I, I think when you learn to give away your money, that's how you buy your own happiness, yeah. right? So the more money I give to my family, my mom, my dad, you, anybody, doesn't matter. That's true. Not really just money, like here's cash, here, here's some money. It's like opportunity. When you learn to give your money away and you learn to give away your opportunity, yeah. right? Like, and you learn to teach people, that's when you find true satisfaction on all the hard work, right? Because it doesn't matter what you go and buy. You can buy a Bentley today and a Bentley tomorrow and a Bentley the next day for yourself. and they all will be meaningless to you in a couple of weeks, yeah. right? They're all just transit. But if you buy a Bentley for your mom yeah. and you make your mom's life, it, it'll be meaning to you for years, right? And that's just that we have to live by that, right? So for me, just real picky, I just want to interject on that because like I cannot stand when people call like well-deserving, you know, quality people, rich assholes. Money just accelerates who you are as a person. If you're an asshole before you have money, you're going to be just a bigger asshole after money. But if you're a genuine person before you have money, you're going to be the most genuine person when you have money. Anyway, where was I at? Uh, had a bunch of failed business, not a bunch, but like a handful of failed businesses because of the work ethic. And then I, I decided to grow in life. I'm an introvert. I, I like, I'm a cancer. He's completely uh, lying about that. I'm an introvert. I stay in, I stay in my shell. Oh my God. Maybe compared to you, I'm an extrovert, but I'm a total introvert. So Edmund, you're literally chanting on the top of your lungs, acting like a T-Rex in the middle of Scottsdale, Arizona. So, like <laughs> that's with the help of Don Julio. <laughs> oh, okay. Don Julio <laughs> makes you a, not an introvert. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's my alter ego when tequila hits me. Anyway, so Houston and I met, um, like 2018 probably 2018, yeah, something like 2018 like four years ago we just like really hit it off it's funny because like and I, the, I think the reason we hit it off is because of your work ethic i was like dude i can't believe i finally found the guy similar age works just as hard as me loves cars we're like into the same thing he's married i'm not but i want to be married so like it's cool <laughs> it's not, yeah <laughs> i'm like there <laughs> so uh yeah, we, we hit it off and uh, we just like became best pals after that. I, I would always like come to Vegas just to hang out with them. It's then, interesting because we spent so much time together, like in the beginning, like so like it was like almost like we were living together. Yeah. Like it, that, that's you, what your really, wife thought we were gay. Legitimately, my wife hung actually so thought that me and Edmund were in a relationship. <laughs> like we went to Hawaii together. <laughs> she, she was pregnant. Yeah. So she was going through some like hormonal, hormonal issues. Things. Yeah. Issues. We were in Hawaii together because I was looking at a location out there and I was like, hey, Edmund, do you want to go with me? He's like, yeah, I'll go. <laughs> so, oh man, she must have called me 7,000 times in that two week or that two day period that we were in Hawaii. We were supposed totally to ruin our like vacation. Six days, <laughs> find some locations. You want to move royalty into Hawaii. We're we're, yeah, we're locations. at a location over there. My wife told Totally ruined our, our yeah, vacation. We were in Hawaii for 24 hours. Had yeah. to come back. So stupid. Yeah. We uh, should go back again. I don't know. I didn't like Hawaii. It wasn't, it wasn't for me. It's yeah. Crazy. Anyway, we hit it off. And then uh, my life, my, my like life's ambition was to start my own car company. So when I was 10, leaving Sweden, Koenigsegg had just... Uh, Got you know, popular. So, yeah, not really popular. He was still like a single garage making a car. He had just announced his concept. It was like... Big news in Sweden. Sweden only has like three TV channels. Really, <laughs> one, two, and three. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're like, yeah, you're just scrolling through the, the news. Uh, that, that's what it was. It's and so big in Sweden, actually. Sweden's the largest investor in Koenigsegg, I bet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was big news, right? Sweden makes a car, mm -hmm. a fight, Lamborghini, Bugatti, yeah, Bugatti Col uh, Ferrari, and mm -hmm. it actually looked good. It looked so great. I, I saw that. I was like, dude, I can do this. All I need is a million. I always thought I need $40 million in my bank account. So I've been working, I was working on that to get 40 mil. And then you approached me. You're like, hey, I'm building this car. Want to partner with me? I was like, yeah, but I don't have 40 million. Like, it's not going to cost 40 mil. It's just going to cost us like a few mil each. We could get it done. I was like, let's do it. That's how we got started in the hybrid car. And then fast forward, just COVID happened. Just sucked, man. It's like, it sucks that the car is not a business. That's the problem. It's a passion project. It's a passion right? project. So, and that's why it's not. I, I look, it, it could take off. I mean, we'll see after look, releasing these pictures today. It could be a business. I mean, 94% of that car is done. You know, yeah, build like 25 of these. You got 25 deposits. We're good. Finish the car. <sighs> like everyone else, Koenigsegg announced the Jesco in 2018. Jesus. They're releasing the car next year. Hopefully, it's a been five years. Anybody wants to know deposits. what a Jesco deposit is, it's uh, about a million, too. 
Yeah. So depending on when you got your allocation, could even be a million five. Um, you just got to give them all that money and hope that they make it for you in the I next mean, four they'll years. They'll make it, but you know when they deliver it is the thing. It's wild. So. All the but all the new manufacturers are doing that now. Three hundred k to apply for the allocation. Mm-hmm. When you get approved, five hundred k. When you spec your car, another million, right? And then you pay the balance due on delivery. And almost every new hypercar is three and a half million. Yeah. Right base like starting, you know, uh, J- the Valkyrie, the Jesco, the all these crazy cars, you know. The only one I think that's actually under two million dollars is the uh, C10. C10, what is that? The Pagani. I mean, if we if we just took a quarter million dollar deposit, all those cars would be done. Yeah, within so two years. We decided to put the car on hold to work on the chicken business. We'll get to the car probably a year from now. We'll, well start building it again. My personal plan is. Um, I'm going to downsize my uh, Vegas lifestyle here. I live in like a stupid, expensive $8 million house right now that like, I don't even go home. I'm working all day. And so my plan was to like downsize, get like a $2 million house and then buy one in Italy. So I wanted to have a Europe presence for, for Houston's hot chicken. And it's funny because both Edmund and I both want to control Europe and neither of us want to stay here in America. So maybe the two of us are going to go there and we're going to give the, uh, the rain star CEO Matt in America. But, um, but yeah, like I was thinking the other day, I was like, why do I want to keep living like this so much, so aggressive, so fast. And like, I'm spending so much money to basically keep up with the Joneses in my own head, Yeah, you know? And like the cars, the planes and all that stuff. Like, I feel like, I feel like we're just wasting a lot of time. Yeah. But I don't feel like you're kind of like me. I, I don't think you're buying all the cars to keep up with the Joneses. You no, buy no, the cars it's a, because you enjoy the Oh, cars. I absolutely love the you cars. You buy the plane because you want the freedom of being able to fly whenever Correct. you want without getting yelled at. Yeah. Which, by the way, just be nice and they won't yell. The point is, is like, I just, I think living here, like culturally being with like YouTube and everything that we're doing, I feel like I'm almost like poised to just keep going harder and harder and harder and try to keep leveling myself up. Right. There's a lot. I mean, there's so many levels above us. Yeah. Like if you guys think that we have money, that's why the richest men in the world are always depressed because there's always someone richer and they're always at this point, we're just trying to get to a billion. Right. You can once, keep to a billion. Once Let's you get to a billion, <laughs> right, then you're numbered. Right. Where do you stack among the rest of the billionaires? Right. You're on this list and then you're just like constantly trying to fight up the list, like move up the ladder. That's why every billionaire, not, not every, but like most honestly, billionaires dude, they're in the world all, are depressed. I, I've I known a lot of very, very, very rich people. And almost every one of them has some sort of depression or something like, I mean, one of my friends, he just sold a company and got like 60 or $70 million out there in um, uh, Scottsdale. And he doesn't seem happy, you know? You told me about, yeah. Yeah. He, he doesn't seem happy. Like he has all the money in the world. And like, I know it's so easy to say, but like, what I think his company was his purpose. And that's kind of the, the thing for me is I don't actually feel like, the companies that we have are our purpose. We have a greater purpose, mm-hmm. right? The companies are our uh, vessels to get to our greater purposes, yeah. right? I mean, Edmund's uh, very concerned about, you know, which I am as well, but, uh, you know, children and orphanages, and he wants to help and do that kind of stuff. And, you know, I kind of want to teach this new generation, like my daughter's generation and Edmund's kids' generation, like kind of like the old way of life, mm-hmm. right? Like this whole, YouTube thing is it's got all these kids thinking that they could just the, the lifestyle is not is not really it's just not really healthy right I mean the, the the suicide rate among kids is a real thing there's actually a number for that like if you would ask me if if kids commit suicide I'd say no like no one but there's a real actual number for that and it's mostly like young girls right I have two girls which makes me really nervous right I don't I, they actually go to homeschool. I'm, I don't let them go to a regular school, private school, public school. I don't care what school. Organized school for me is is complicated. But like, you know, it makes me nervous. I don't want them to think that this is what's important. You know, I really wish that Instagram would just change the like how many people you're following, right? Because I think that's a huge issue too. People get persecuted for following too many people. What is, why is that a thing? You know, like, why does anybody care how many people you're following? It's like exclusive now. If you have too many friends, you're not cool. Uh, So you're supposed to have no friends. My point is, is like, this is not the world that I want to live in. I don't want my kids to have to feel 
not important or, you know, just under beneath someone else, like this hierarchy. I mean, the most aggressive person in the room now usually wins. The high, the most people that yell the loudest or loudest voice, yeah. the loudest voice, whatever that saying is, that's kind of what's happening in schools today, you know, and it's just, it's complicated. That's all I'm saying. As a parent, I'm 33, but I mean, all these new problems happen when I had kids. I mean, like you don't have these problems yet, but when you have kids, you're going to be like, oh my God, I have so many things to think about now. There's a lot of things to be said on, on that topic about today's society, terms and words that like didn't even exist when you and I grew up. I don't want to teach my children like these things like i don't know how to get away from it and i feel like in europe i mean most of my family lives in italy so i'm, I'm first generation american my dad's born in italy and, and from italy and they don't have the same problems that we do you know they have yeah. way different problems and their problems are mostly financial because that's the greatest enemy in europe is taxes and you know how hard it is to start a business and all that stuff whereas in america that's probably the easiest thing to do is to make money but then everything else is hard you know, your quality of life is so much different here. 100%. Yeah, like, yeah. But anyway, let's get back to the chicken video because Mario's getting pissed off. It's a long video. This is going to be the longest video you've ever made. Like, you know. Should we do like podcast part one, part two? No, no, this is good. You know, actually, every podcast is supposed to be an hour. You know, you bring on interesting guests. Yeah, no, I mean, my podcast with uh, Graham Stefan was like probably an hour and a half, right? Yeah, yeah. You had a lot to say, right? Uh. So we'll work on it. Houston's uh, getting the flow of running a podcast. I watch a lot of podcasts. I love podcasts. This is a good podcast. This, this is a good one. All right, look, this podcast is over. Thanks, Edmund, for my guests. But okay. we're going to just turn the cameras off right now and turn them right back on and start talking about uh, our chicken money and uh, the chicken business. Let's go to touch on Edmund's new car because I've kind of convinced him to uh, uh, get uh, another car after the F40. And I think that's going to be a pretty sweet topic. So maybe we'll do a, uh, you know, hypercar reveal that you haven't bought yet because I'm going to try to convince you to do that. I just got suckered into buying a hypercar, another hypercar. <laughs> cool. <Sick. laughs> All right. Adios.